So after discussing the failures of the Articles of Confederation, the very next step is to discuss the Constitutional Convention, because this is the solution that they come up with, particularly after Shays' Rebellion, which, remember, we talked about the weaknesses of the Articles. Shays' Rebellion was kind of the straw that broke the camel's back, if you've heard that saying before, where people finally said, listen, this government's not working, we need to come up with something different. So they meet in... Philadelphia in the summer of 1787. It is hot. Very, very hot. Almost record-breaking. The goal, replace the Articles of Confederation. Now, if you notice in this painting, there is the one open window. That's actually slightly inaccurate. You can see the other closed windows. Windows were all closed. Shades were drawn because this was supposed to be a very, very secretive meeting and they didn't want anyone knowing about the deliberations until they actually finished the document. So you can imagine, and look at what they're wearing too. They're wearing overcoats, stockings. A lot of them had wigs on. And you can imagine the heat with the windows closed and shades drawn and overcoats and what was considered proper dress for a public figure at that time. So it's a pretty miserable experience, which leads to some pretty heated debate over some of the major issues that come up. They start the document with the preamble, and they specifically choose to start the document with we the people of the United States. The reason they did this, they wanted to show that there was unified support for a stronger federal government. A lot of people thought that the power that was with the state governments under the Articles of Confederation was really the only proper way to move forward. So really, if they were going to replace that with a stronger federal government, they wanted to show that everyone was in support of that. The first three articles, are outlining the three branches of government. Now, if you remember back to learning about the Enlightenment, Baron de Montesquieu is the Enlightenment thinker who suggests the three-branch system. So, Articles 1 through 3 show the desire for separation of powers, so dividing the government into three branches, but also checks and balances. The power of each of those branches was going to be carefully chosen so that one branch could check the power of another so that no one branch became too powerful. A lot of people think that these two terms are interchangeable. They are not. Separation of powers and checks and balances are two very different things. They go together, but they are two very different things. Separation of powers is physically separating the government. So if you look at this pie graph looking uh, chart, it is showing equal division of the three branches of government checks and balances is the system that is created due to the separation of powers. So two very different terms. So Article 1, the legislative branch. So the first intention was for the legislature to be divided into two houses. So bicameral is explained in Article 1 of the Constitution. Bi, we've already learned, means two. It's a root word for two. Una means one. So a bicycle or a unicycle would be the good example here. Cameral sounds like camel. Again, we've talked about this before. So yes, Mr. Baker's very funny. Two-humped camel would be bicameral legislature. A one-humped camel, a unicameral legislature. I know, I'm cheesy, but you're just going to have to bear with me because I tell lots of cheesy jokes all year. So Article 1 also addresses um, what the bicameral legislature would be like. The House of Representatives, which back then was smaller because there were fewer states, but today there are a total of 435 members. You have to be a minimum of 25 years old to serve, minimum of 7 years as a citizen. So you can be an immigrant and serve in the House of Representatives, but you need to have lived in the United States for at least seven years first. It is a two-year term of office. It owns the power to impeach officials. A lot of people think only the president can be impeached. Anyone in the government, including a member of the House of Representatives, can be impeached. So if someone is seen to have done something illegal, they can be impeached. Proportional representation, very important term to remember. That means that representation is based on population. So New York and California have a much, much higher number of representatives in the House of Representatives 
because their population is much larger than, say, Wyoming, which only has one representative in the House of Representatives. This is a photograph of the current 25th Congressional District representative, Dan Maffei. He served once from 2009 to 2011. He then lost re-election, but then was elected back into the same seat two years later. That's why there are question marks, because not really sure when he will decide to stop or if he loses re-election again. He replaces Anne-Marie Burkle, who served for two years, obviously himself for the two years prior to that, and a long-term representative named Jim Walsh, who served for 20 years prior to Mr. Maffei's first term of office. The second part of the legislative branch is the Senate, which is 100 members, and the reason for that is there's two per state equal representation. So 50 states, times two, easy math, 100 members. If we were to add a state for any reason at some point, it would be 102. So you have to be a minimum of 30 years old to be in the Senate. You have to have lived in the country for at least nine years. So again, you can be an immigrant, but you have to have lived for nine years as a citizen. It is a six-year term of office. That is the longest elected office term in the federal government. When someone is impeached by the House of Representatives, the Senate is responsible for holding the trial, and the Supreme Court Chief Justice presides over the proceedings. So an accused person of something that should have them removed from office is tried by the Senate. So the 100 members of the Senate, unless one of them is the one on trial, would essentially be the jury. Like I said a minute ago, equal representation, so two per state. And lastly, the vice president leads the Senate and breaks any tie votes. So if the Senate is divided 50 from one party, 50 from another, and nobody crossed party lines and there was an exact tie vote on something, it would be the vice president who broke the tie vote. That's all of what is actually the uh, conclusion of Article 1. But the question is, how did they decide it that way? Like, what were the deliberations? This is a funny little joke, again, from Mr. Baker, because Thomas Jefferson on the left here and Alexander Hamilton on the right hated each other. Jefferson actually wasn't there for the Constitutional Convention. He was in France trying to strike up good trade agreements with the French after the end of the revolution. And Alexander Hamilton on the right, uh, they hated each other because Jefferson leaned much more in the direction of we should keep the Articles of Confederation. And Alexander Hamilton thought that the federal government should have more power. So this little joke of Hamilton, you're an idiot. Well, at least I didn't plagiarize the Declaration of Independence because if you remember John Locke's ideas was pretty much everything Thomas Jefferson put in the Declaration of Independence. So, yes, they disliked each other, and these are the two sides of the argument at the Constitutional Convention. Anti-Federalists, like Jefferson, who still wanted state power, and Federalists, like Alexander Hamilton, who wanted to see the federal government gain more power. The first main argument about the legislative branch was differing opinions about representation. The Virginia plan said that representation should be based on population and that slaves should count as a part of your population. So what that would mean is that a unicameral legislature, so one house body, would be based on population. In this time period, Virginia was the most heavily populated state in the entire 13 original states. So, naturally, they're going to want to advantage themselves. The New Jersey plan, on the other hand, said that representation should be equal for all states, and slaves should not count as a part of your population because they're not citizens. New Jersey is one of the smaller states, so naturally they're going to want representation to be equal. They also had very few slaves, so that's why they wouldn't want them to count towards representation. So, the Virginia plan also called sometimes the big state plan as a nickname, and then the New Jersey plan, or the small state plan as a nickname. The only way the gridlock on this argument was ever broken was the Connecticut Compromise, also known as the Great Compromise, and this essentially was an agreement that we'll do one of each. The idea was actually James Madison's, but James Madison was from Virginia, so he really didn't want to propose it himself, or it might look like he was trying to sway things in favor of Virginia. So he asked Roger Sherman, a friend of his from Connecticut, 
to propose the plan, and Sherman was more than happy to do so. So he proposes the plan to do one house of proportional representation and one house of equal representation. Both houses under this plan would have to approve of bills to be sent to the president to become law. And later in this unit, we're going to go through this in detail with a lesson on how a bill becomes a law. And here's just another joke of Connecticut asking, um, can't we all just get along? The three-fifths compromise um, settled how much would slaves count towards representation. New Jersey obviously thought they shouldn't count. Virginia thought they should count. They reached an agreement that slaves would count as three-fifths of a person. They also agreed that there would be no law outlawing the slave trade for 20 years. 20 years from then, in 1808, the slave trade would end. And lastly, no slave tax could exceed $10. That was a large sum of money in this time period. So at a slave auction, a $10 tax would be a large sum of money. Another compromise was necessary over trade. Um, northern states that were producers of goods wanted there to be heavy import tariffs so that foreign goods would be more expensive than domestic goods made here in the United States and that would help their businesses sell American products. On the other hand, southern agricultural states opposed taxes on exports due to their cash crop economy. Tobacco and cotton are major commodities in Europe and the southern states make a lot of money selling those things to Europe. So it's an easy decision. There would be taxes on imports, but not on exports. So no exported product from the United States continued right through to today has ever been taxed. Article 2 addresses the executive branch, and this is one person, the President of the United States. And the President has to be a natural born citizen. So you are not allowed to have been an immigrant to this country. You have to have been born in the United States. You have to be a minimum of 35 years old. It is a four-year term. The president appoints Supreme Court vacancies. So if someone retires or because it is a lifetime term serves until their death, there is a vacancy on the Supreme Court at that point and the president fills that vacancy. He is considered the chief executive which is the leader of the government, chief diplomat, which means the president is the only one allowed to negotiate with foreign leaders. Yes, you can do it via ambassadors to other countries, but only the president can sign a treaty with another country. And the president is considered commander-in-chief, which is a term describing the fact that they're in charge of the military. Pictured is President Barack Obama, serving from 2009 through 2017. Article 3 addresses the judicial branch, the Supreme Court, and the lower courts. There's really no uh, specifications as to the number of justices or what would consider you qualified. Um, the very first court had six justices. Today there are nine, and the reason for that is so that there won't be any tie votes. It's an odd number. Um, there's actually been many, many five to four decisions on the Supreme Court. And the biggest power of the judicial branch is that they can declare laws or actions of government unconstitutional. The minute the court declares something unconstitutional, it is null and void, no matter where it came from. So today's Supreme Court, as of 2013, the longest serving justice is Associate Justice Antonin Scalia, and he is the gentleman in the front row wearing glasses right here. And next longest serving is Associate Justice Anthony Kennedy. He is also wearing glasses in the front row here. Associate Justice Clarence Thomas, who is all the way to the left in the front row. Associate Justice Ruth Bader Ginsburg, who is all the way to the right in the front row. Associate Justice Stephen Breyer, who is right here in the back row, to the left a little bit. Chief Justice John Roberts, who is seated in the center of the front row. Associate Justice Samuel Alito, who is this tall gentleman here just off to the right in the back row. 
And the newest justices, both appointed by President Obama in the last few years, are Associate Justice Sonia Sotomayor, all the way to the left here. Justice Sotomayor happens to be the first ever Hispanic to serve on the Supreme Court. And then all the way to the right in the back row is the newest justice to the court, Associate Justice Elena Kagan. All nine of these people have a lot of courtroom experience. Um, you have to have a pretty impressive resume to be considered for the Supreme Court. So every last one of these people is very, very highly qualified. They do differ in opinion quite often, but it doesn't change the fact that, yes, all of them are very, very, very qualified and have a lot of courtroom experience. Now, after addressing the three branches of government, there were some other issues that needed to be sorted out. In Article 4, interstate relations, and really the regulation of trade, was addressed. Remember, under the Articles of Confederation, there was no regulation of trade, and that meant that each state could have its own currency, among other things. That made things extremely difficult to foster trade and therefore people making money. Section 1 of Article 4 says that states shall share documents and resources when necessary. Section 2 said that a citizen's rights do not change when crossing state lines. Part 2, criminals are not free if they manage to escape to another state. And Part 3, slaves are not free just because they escape to another state. Section 3 laid out the protocol for territories to become states. This is modeled after the Northwest Ordinance, which was one of the few successes of the Articles of Confederation, if you remember. Section 4 says that the U.S. federal government shall always protect states against invasion and or domestic violence. So really, the military and or National Guard can and will be used to protect the member states of the country against any kind of invasion or domestic violence. So, for example, when there was a threat of violence during the integration of schools, during the Civil Rights Movement, President Eisenhower sent the National Guard to keep the peace. Article 5 addressed the amendment process. So the only way to add an amendment to the Constitution is a two-thirds majority vote of both the House and the Senate and three-quarters of the state legislatures must approve. The first ten amendments to the Constitution are called the Bill of Rights. We are going to learn these in great detail in an upcoming lesson. Article 6 addresses some other miscellaneous issues. So, Section 1, all debts owed by the Confederation are going to remain the same. We're not going to renege on any debts that we owed to other countries. Section 2, in any situation where a state law conflicts with federal law, the federal government is to be considered supreme. So, Section 2 establishes federal supremacy. Section 3, all public officials will take an oath of office, but cannot have their religious beliefs work in their favor, nor can they be used against them. So, eventually, the Bill of Rights, you're going to see the First Amendment as well, freedom of speech and freedom of religion, etc., but Section 3 kind of gave you a preview of that by saying that religious beliefs cannot work in someone's favor, nor can it work against them. Article 7 said that the ratification process would require 9 of the 13 states to approve of the Constitution. Once 9 approved, it would become the official government of the United States. And the Convention releases the Constitution to the public to review on September 17th. 1787. You wonder, how long did it take for it to get ratified? Well, it got released in September, and it took three months before anyone ever actually voted to approve it. So people took their time. Uh, state legislatures took their time to make sure that they liked what had been created. Nine states ratified the Constitution by June of 1788, so not quite a year. All 13 original states had ratified the Constitution by May of 1790. 
the last state to ratify being Rhode Island. The ninth state where the Constitution became law was New Hampshire. New York came in at 11. And Delaware is known as the first state because it is the first to ratify the Constitution. So I hope that you took good notes. Remember to log on to the website and take the online quiz that goes along with this video. And I will see you in class tomorrow. Thank you.